Stand to your feet. Come on. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, and we are people in this Bible study tonight that we have absolutely no idea what we're doing, and we so desperately need you, Jesus. We know that the teacher of the church is not a man or a woman. We know that the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. All of it goes to you because this church is built by your grace and love and mercy and compassion. And we thank you for it, Father, that we get to be part of a great church like this that cares about not only you, but cares about your greatest love, your people. And we thank you, Father, that we get to keep ministering and loving your people, building them, encouraging them, helping them in every area and every way we can. We're so grateful. As you bless us tonight, Lord, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the inland empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodist Episcopalian. Charismatics, Pentecostals, thank you for Calvary chapels and Harvest and Oak Valley and Oasis and all the great churches that are out there the way. Uh, we just thank you, Father, for just blessing them. They're our brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, do we think of ourselves as better than any of them. But we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, that's yours, building one kingdom, and it's yours. And God will give you the praise and give you the glory as you bless them and bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. Tonight, if you will, we're going to go again to the profound words of Jesus. Is everybody okay with that on Wednesday nights when I get to share the word of God? Has it been good before in the past for you? profound words of Jesus. And tonight we're not going to be any different. We're just going to just love it. I, I use that and I've said it before, pro profound because they're amazing. You know, when you get into it, sometimes what we do is we make a great mistake in American churches. In our own homes, we make this mistake. We just kind of read through the Bible, you know, as fast as we can read it. We want the Lord to see that we read three chapters today. Aren't we great? We don't remember anything the three chapters said, but we read all three chapters. So this is, if you will, part number seven. I didn't realize there was that many of them. I thought it was four or five. And yet at the same time, um, tonight as we get together and study the Word of God, let's just do this. God wants to speak to you. Now we're going to cover, because it's the profound words of Jesus, we're going to cover a lot of things Jesus says. He doesn't always just say one thing. He says, he says something, and when you look at the Word of God, you've got to evaluate the Word of God for more than just what its face value says. For an example, I need to know what the face value of the Bible, what it says, but I also need to know the character, nature, and attributes of God behind it. Because if I know the character, nature, and attributes of God, and I apply that to what he is saying, then I get a full perspective of what God's heart is all about. When I understand God's heart, when I do, guess what? Then I can apply it in my life, and I get blessed. And you can apply it in your life, and you can get blessed too, because God wants to bless you because he loves you so much. You're his kids. You are the most important and valuable, we'll see that tonight, commodity on the planet. You are. There is no gold, there's no silver, there's no oil, there's nothing else on this planet that's worth more than you sitting in that chair right now as God sees you. And that's one of the things that we have really uh, stress in this church as we work very hard because we know that God loves you so much. You are his sheep. He is the shepherd. And the closer you get to the shepherd, the safer you are in life. And the more you know about the word of God, the more you know about God, the closer you'll get, the safer you'll be. As we look at the word of the Lord, last time we were together we were in Matthew, the 10th chapter. And um, I'm going to continue Matthew 10 chapter. I actually have a couple of more messages. Matthew, the 10th chapter is one of my favorite chapters. It just says so much. And so if you've got your Bible or if you want to turn on your electronic devices, please do so. But if you're going to turn on the electronic devices, then be honest with yourself. It doesn't mean you have the freedom to text your friends and wherever they're at and receive texts and send texts. Because I know some people every now and then I will look over at their electronic device and I won't tell you who it is, and they're texting during church. 
but I can't tell you who it is because I want to go home tonight. And so um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> she says she's making notes, but I'm not sure. Maybe she is. I don't know. Uh, tonight, as we pick up on verse number 28, the 10th chapter of Matthew, a lot of things being said. There's absolutely no one, two, and three, you know, like we usually do. Here's three reasons or four reasons why to do this and how to do these things. It's just kind of like brothers and sisters gathering tonight for a Bible study. We used to, back in the 70s, Deborah and I would have, a, a, we had a, there were home ministry she was part of, and uh, we'd all get together, sit in the living room, do you remember that? And they'd suddenly break out the Bible, and we'd just talk about Jesus, and it was, it was just really wonderful to, to have a little Bible study. So this is kind of a, like a Bible study tonight. Verse number 28, 10th chapter of Matthew says this. This is where we left off, by the way, but I wanted to talk about it a little bit more. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Uh, when, when Jesus makes a statement to his disciples, it's recorded here for all of us. It, it, it's an interesting statement because if you study the word of God, you'll find every time an angel comes on the scene, Every time Jesus is on the scene, every time some miraculous thing's going to take place, the Holy Spirit shows up, the first words almost out of their mouth on a continuous basis is fear not. And you'll see that God is not interested in you fearing anything. And remember, most of the time, for many of us that are in here, we understand the word fear is like a two-sided coin. We've taught you that for the years. One side of fear is reverence and respect the other side of fear is just plain afraid. Just don't mess with God. So this two-sided coin, one is fear. In other words, I respect and I so reverence you. But the other side of the coin is like, don't mess with God. And God's really somebody that doesn't mix around things. He's not going to be mocked, if you will. And remember that he says this, do not mock God. That's what it is. Sometimes we think we can get away with stuff and you really can't get away with stuff with God. God sees everything. God knows everything. But here he makes a statement and he says this, do not fear. He says, those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. You know, in other words, why would you fear man? Why would you fear the devil? And all of a sudden, I stopped and I thought, you know, oftentimes in our lives, we do fear men. And oftentimes in our lives, we do fear the devil. And here he tells us, listen, that's not the ultimate power on the planet, but that he is. And I remember one time getting ready in this church for, for a Sunday morning service. I was putting on a suit and tie. Thank God those days passed. <laughs> and um, I was getting ready upstairs. It was early in the morning. Remember this, Mama? And, and all of a sudden, we heard somebody in our kitchen downstairs. We were upstairs in our bedroom. And, and I said, what's that noise? I, I hear these people talking. And there's two guys talking downstairs. And I said to Debbie, 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 be quiet. Be quiet. They must not know we're here. And, and, and I'm telling you that. Have you ever had that where the hair stands up in the back of your neck, man, on your arms? You're afraid. Anybody ever been there besides me? Man, and the more I heard these guys talk, I said, she says, what are they saying? I said, I know, I can't understand it. I, I just can't understand what they're saying. She said, are you sure they're in our kitchen? I said, babe, they are in the kitchen. Early morning, getting ready to go to church. I said, okay, you stay here. Don't come down. I'm going down after them. She says, you're going to preach the gospel. I said, I got my gun. She says, what are you going to do with a gun? I said, honey, I'm going to shoot them and then go to church and preach the gospel. <laughs> well, if that bothers you, that's just the way I've always been. I'll pray for them later. I'll deal with God when I see him. You know, I'm a, so I get my gun and I'm talking, don't fear man, you know, don't fear. I got hair standing up. on. I am petrified. And, and there'd be long times of silence. And then these guys would start talking again. And I realized they were talking in Spanish. 
And I'm going, I don't understand a word. What are they doing in my kitchen? So I'm sneaking down the stairs, you know, old crickly old stairs. I got my gun, man. I cocked that thing. I'm going to bust in there. I go around the corner. I do the fist, two fist things, you know, and there ain't nobody there. My radio that was in the wall <laughs> shorted out on a Spanish speaking station <laughs> with two guys talking back and forth. I remember the hair on my arm said, oh, relax, you know what I mean? Uh, I was so grateful. I'm a little disappointed I didn't get to shoot them. But I, I'm, no, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Don't email me that. Tell me about how bad I am. I'm playing with you now. But he says, don't fear those that kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him. Notice the capital H in the word him, God. I mean, if there's anything to respect and be afraid of, it's God. Because God could do something that no one else can. No man can do this. No devil can do this. He could destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And I'm here to tell you something tonight. If you don't do anything else, hear that one message. Get serious about God. This is a time for all of us to realize who we are, what's ahead of us, what God wants for us. Because as we get into the 10th chapter of Matthew, it even gets even deeper as far as commitment to the things of God. And God starts right off and tells you, man's not where the fear is at. The devil's not where the fear is at. God should be where the fear is at. And you know something? Can I tell you something? A lot of times I didn't do the things that I wanted to do or felt like doing because I just simply feared God too much. You know, there's many times when Debbie said, I would love to just smack you right in the mouth, but I love God too much to do that. <laughs> oh, I'm happy that she loved God a lot. Amen, somebody say. She didn't say that, but I'm going to get in trouble for saying that when I get home. <laughs> Verse number 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? In other words, don't they have some value? Two sparrows. You ever seen little sparrows out there in your yard, maybe on a tree? They seem so insignificant. They seem like nothing. They're small. They don't do anything. How many billions of them are there on this planet? Probably billions and billions and billions of little sparrow-like birds that are out there. And they're sold for two. Listen to this. Copper coins. He comes along and makes this statement. Are not one of them falls to the ground apart from, the God's, from your father's will? In other words, the father not only knows it, it's his will when one of them falls. God has this whole planet in control. And I don't care what you say, he's got your life in control. He's got your future in control. For those of you who've got lousy kids, you guess what? Don't, don't worry about it. He's got them in control. He's going to let them be, uh, listen, the lousy marriage, he's got the marriage in control. God's got this whole thing in control. All you need to do is rest in him. He can do it, take care of you. Notice how the next verse, number 30, comes along and makes this statement. On, he says this. But for every, listen to this, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God knows who you are and what you are. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. Did you know, I have a lot of quirks in my life, a lot of issues in my life. I have a lot of things in my life that somehow I don't know why I act that way, but I do, or why I feel that way, but I do, uh, or what I like or don't like. Sometimes Debbie say to me, oftentimes she'll say, why do you feel that way? I say, I don't know. I just do, you know? Uh, how come? We all have quirks. We all have little issues. Did you know that we all have little dealings? We all have things in our life, all of us. There isn't a person in here, does not Did you know one of the things that makes God so incredible merciful is that he knows where those issues came from. He knows where those quirks came from. He knows what it was in your past or in your life that caused you to be what you are today. 
He knows about how you maybe attain that through the, the sins of a father, not just the one you just had, because my dad was pretty good, but the sins of the fathers and the fathers, 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 that go all the way back, that your DNA comes all the way forth, and now it becomes a quirk in your life or keeps you from being something or doing something. God knows that. That's why he is so merciful. He knows more about you. If he can count the hairs on your head, let me tell you something. There's no problem you're facing that he can't take care of. Come on, somebody. He's totally and completely in control. And that's what we're seeing Jesus making this statement saying. Now, the good thing about this is that, listen, with God, when you get God, you get a new family. With God, you get a new DNA. With God, you're now part of his bloodline. You're now part of his inheritance now. All the old things pass away. Behold, all things become what? New. And if all things become new, so all the quirks that I had before, all the issues, all the dealings, all the little stuff that I couldn't quite break, can I tell you something? In Christ Jesus, they're broken. All you need to do is walk in the victory of it. And because he knows everything about you, he knows why you are the way you are. He knows you better than you know yourself. And that is such a cool thing. If he knows me better, then he knows how to get me to where I need to go. And that's good news. Somebody say amen. amen. I love the next verse. It comes along and he makes this statement in verse number 31. Do not fear, therefore. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Why are you fearing anything? You have value. You are the most valuable commodity on the planet. You may be not the most valuable commodity to other humans. They'd sell you out in a minute for a gold ring. They'd sell you out in a minute for a barrel of oil. They would sell you out in a minute for a bag of precious stones. But God would give all of the heavens and the earth for you. And the highest price that could ever be paid for you was paid. And it was Jesus Christ. That makes you the most valuable. I know your teachers at school said you were a jerk. I know the politicians think you're a fool and can trick you constantly, lying to you, thinking you're going to believe that trash. I know they think you're an idiot. I know that people in your life have hurt you and people haven't respected you and people don't think much of you, but there's a God in heaven, the creator of the heavens and the earth that sees you. Yes, you. And wait a minute, I don't care how you see yourself. I'm telling you how he sees you. He sees you as the most valuable commodity on the planet. He didn't pay for you with diamonds. He didn't pay for you with precious stones. He didn't pay for you with a bag of gold or silver or barrels of oil. He paid with you. He broke from his side himself and sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, and paid the highest price he could pay with his life for your life. You are the most important and most valuable people upon the planet. Now, why is Jesus saying that? He says, do not fear, therefore. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Why is he saying that? Because we have a tendency to look at ourselves and not believe we're valuable. Oh, I'm too fat. I don't have pretty hair. I don't, I'm not cool. I don't have any money. I don't have any education. I'm, a, I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. Nobody liked me. I married somebody. They dumped me. Oh, my goodness. Can I tell you something? You are the most valuable commodity on this planet. Don't let this take place. Stop thinking about anything else. But realize when you look in the mirror, man, God made you. That's the most important thing in the world. And he loves you and died for you because you're so valuable. That's good news, my friend. It's good news you don't have to stay the way you were with your past uh, DNA telling you how to live life. It's good news that you're entered into a new kingdom. It's a good news that old things pass away and behold, all things become new. That's good news and the gospel is good news. That's what Jesus is talking about with his disciples. Listen, you guys, stop worrying about this thing. You're a whole lot more valuable than some silly little 
sparrows when yet he cares about them. How much more does he care about you? Wow. So amazing, so amazing for us to see. Then he comes along and he says in verse number 32, therefore, whoever confesses me, now here comes, it seems like a completely change. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me, and he comes along and he says this, me before men, and he says, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. All of a sudden, now he's talking about how valuable you are and how much God cares about you, but how much do you care about God? The whole subject starts to change. As God so wonderful, cares about the sparrows, thinks you're more important. Don't fear men, don't fear the devil, put your respect and reverence on him. And it's all about you and how wonderful you are and how valuable you are. And now the transition starts to take place. What do you think of God? How deep is your commitment? What are you like when chips are down and your pressure's on? And he makes this statement, and he says these words, and it's so important for us to see in verse number 33. But whoever denies me before men, oftentimes we feel funny about who we are in Christ. Some of you feel funny carrying a Bible. I used to feel that way. I used to say, well, I'll carry the Bible in church, but as soon as I get in church, I'm gonna put the Bible aside I didn't want anybody to see me carrying a Bible. Then God said, you know what? You're embarrassed about me, and I know it. You know, you you feel funny carrying that Bible that someone might think you're one of those Bible people. And I was really doing something. I was really denying God. And he says, for you, I want you to do something. I want you to carry your Bible around for a while. Everywhere you go, carry it in a restaurant. Carry it wherever you go. Put a smile on your face and carry your Bible. Man, I hated that for a while. I went everywhere. I happened to be working. I remember at a time in in, uh, Beverly Hills on Wilshire Boulevard was where my office was. It was the heart of being Jewish. Fairfax was right there. Everybody around me was a Jewish businessman, and here I was carrying my Bible. Well, I tell you what, I got over feeling funny about God. And I tell you, I had to learn the lesson the hard way. Some of you are going to have to learn the lesson the hard way. If you still feel funny about being related with God, can I tell you something? You're going to have to go way beyond what would normally be required of you in order to prove that you want to be related with God. And God's going to get you there. Somebody needs to say amen. Whoever denies me before men, sometimes we, you don't realize how much we deny. I mean, we have family members that come and, you know, they, 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 they don't want to hear about it. They say, they used to tell me, keep that religion for Sunday. Can I tell you something? All the years gone by, 40 years goes by. You know, when they're all in problems now, guess who they call me? They don't want it. And they don't wait for Sunday. They call me whenever they need it. Now, all of a sudden, things change. Why? Because I wouldn't hide Jesus. We need to not hide Jesus. We need to be proud that we're Christians. We're proud we live by the word of God. Proud that God gave us eternal word and backs it with his love and his mercy and his grace. God gave his only begotten son and I can hold up my Bible. I can present Jesus to a lost and dying world and I should not feel bad about it. And if you do feel bad about it, you need to hang around some wild Christians that'll help you get past it. And I know there's a few of them on the first three or four rows. <laughs> Guys, that's just the way it is. You know, here this incredible warning comes to us. Whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Verse 34, do not think that I have come. Now, can I, before I read verse 34, if you, have your, if you have your Bible and you have a pen, you need to circle verse 34. It's a nuts statement. It's a statement that used to, when I was a young man as a Christian, read it, and I did not understand it. It made me mad. Do not think that I 
have come to bring peace on earth. Wait a minute. Jesus, you are the prince of peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding is your peace that you give to us. With you in my life, I have peace. And here he starts this verse off. He says, don't think that I come to give peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace. Then he says a most bizarre statement, but a sword. In other words, there's going to be a defining difference between you and the people who don't want God. And doesn't matter who they are. There's going to be like a defining, definite difference between you who want God and those who don't want God. There's no middle line. There's no easy way of getting through this. There's no, you know, compromise both sides of the fence. It is black and white. The ones that don't want me are going to hate your guts. And the ones that do want me are going to be the ones that are there praising my name publicly. And he just makes that statement that is a wild statement. You talk about commitment. And then he goes on and he defines this statement by verse number 35. Notice what it says in verse number 35. It says these words. For I have come to set a man against his father. A daughter against her mother. And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Verse 36, and a man's enemies will be in those in his own household. I've told you the story before, but I think it's appropriate to tell you one more time for those that haven't heard it. I remember a young man that was a strong, addicted drug addict came to the church. He'd been stealing from his parents and relatives for years trying to get enough money to buy drugs, anything that he could steal, he would steal. He actually would take a hammer, if you remember me telling the story, he'd knock his teeth out so he could go get drugs from a dentist. That's how bad his drug addiction was. Don't tell me that making drugs legal in America is a good thing. And I'm here to tell you that he got saved And it was an amazing conversion, an amazing conversion. He stopped everything. He just got free. I when I I I remember he was he I when I prayed for him I didn't think that would ever happen. I I really didn't have much faith at all. But God was there, and bang, he was like free. Just absolutely got free on the whole thing. It was just amazing. A week went by, two weeks went by, three weeks went by, and he came back to me and he said, my parents, I've told them that I'm a Christian and I'm excited and I'm free and I'm just no longer a drug addict. And they made this statement, we much rather have you a drug addict than a Christian. What a horrible thing for parents to say. What a horrible, horrible thing for parents to say. I much rather have you a drug addict than a Christian. And so when he comes along and he makes this statement, a man's enemies will be those in his own household. Let me tell you something. We love our fathers. We love our mothers. We love our, our, our brothers and sisters-in-law. We love our relatives. We like hanging around them. They remind us of ourselves. We like being with them for the most part. Some of them are a little quirky and goofy, and some of them, you know, you could you throw in the ocean and never miss. But I didn't say that. <laughs> The point being is this, is that we love our relatives. And God says, if you love your relatives more than you love me, man, that's, that's a big commitment. If you love your children more than you love God, then when your children have a problem, you'll blame God. If you lo- There's nothing that you're supposed to love more than God. I love my Debbie with all my heart. Debbie is me. I'm Debbie. 
I, I don't want to live without her. I don't want to live away from her. She went shopping today. She said, did you miss me? I said, no. <laughs> she said, there is something that happened while I was shopping that you will miss. <laughs> Guess what it is. The point being is, I'm in love. I love my son. I love my son-in-law. I love my daughters. I got three of them that are fabulous. I've got great, I've just ministered down at Pastor Henny's church in Temecula last week. Fabulous church. My son-in-law married to Miranda, my oldest daughter. And I, I have to tell you guys something. I love my family. But I can't love my family more than I love my God. That's unacceptable to God. Listen to what God is asking of us. That the very first thing you love is him. Because without him, nothing else works. Yeah. Nothing else works. Verse number 37 comes along and he makes this statement. In verse number 37, which is pretty wild. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or his daughter more then me is not worthy of me. Oh my goodness sakes. Guys, can I tell you something? Most of the time, this depth of commitment is not taught in American churches. But these are the words of Jesus. Think about what he's saying right here. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or his daughter more, I mean, I love my children. I love them. Give my life for them. There's one of us in here that wouldn't give our life. But can I tell you something? They are not on the same plane with the love that I have for my God. I love them, but my God is far beyond anything of children. And so many times I will see problems in a family and they back off of God. Then that says who you loved more was the family, then God. I didn't say you don't get hurt when there's problems in the family. I didn't say you don't have a broken heart for a, over a problem in a family. I didn't say you don't cry and you weep over that and wish it didn't happen. I didn't say you don't even at times say, God, I wish it didn't happen and why did it have to happen? And even question, that's not the issue. The issue is if you back off of God because of the family, then the family was more important than your God. Is, are you listening to me? Let me say it again. If you back off of God because of the family, then the family becomes more important than God. And I'm telling you this is so important for us because a lot of times I see a lot of people lose their relationship with God because of what conditions are in the family. Conditions are in the family, you can straighten that out when you go talk to God in heaven because he's a just God, knows exactly what he's doing, and guess what? But in the meantime, you better serve him because he's your number one in your life. Is anybody listening? Without him being number one, without him being number one, the rest of your life fails. All your business, everything else fails. Doesn't matter how much money you make, doesn't matter how powerful you are, no matter how acceptance you are, acceptance, recognition, approval of man, all of that fails. It comes up short without loving God first. That's why God says it. It's not some big ego in the sky that says, I got to be loved. I got to be loved. I'm really insecure. Can I tell you something? He is not insecure and he doesn't need to be loved. We need to love him because in loving him, we get blessed. Somebody ought to say amen. Verse number 38 comes along and says this, and he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, one of the godly principles in scripture is really crazy. This verse is just nuts. It doesn't make sense. Godly principle is that loss of worldly things equals gain of spiritual things. Did you hear what I just said? The principle is a loss of a worldly, earthly thing is a gain in the spiritual. It's all through the scripture. Let me read a few verses to you just for an example. 
I'm going to go to Matthew 19, verse 21, then we'll go to verse 29. But let's go to verse 21 first. Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse 21. And Jesus, here's his words of Jesus once again. Are you listening? He says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. It's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why did he say that? He's not telling you to give everything up. It's not a take a deep breath. He's not telling you to sell your car, get rid of your house, get rid of all your clothes, all that kind of stuff. He's not telling you to do that. What he's making a statement and doing is you can't put your heart on something else other than God. It's all going to be God. You can still have those things. Verse, if you will, 29, listen to what it says in Matthew, the 19th chapter. And everyone who has left house or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wives or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold inherit in eternal life, in eternal life. In other words, you gave up something material on this earth and you got a spiritual abundance. That in itself is an amazing principle. Watch this one. I like this, if you will. In Mark, the ninth chapter, in verse number 35. Listen to these principles. They're really great principles. Mark, the ninth chapter. And he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. In other words, if you want to be the biggest, you got to be the least. (laughs) That doesn't even make sense. That doesn't even make sense to our common thinking. What he just said is the largest is the one who takes care of the people, the one who is the least. It's not the one who's the most powerful, the one who's seen the most, one who has the most abundance. You know that bumper sticker, the one that ends life with the most toys wins? It's a lie. I'm not saying that God wants you in poverty. God wants to bless you. That's why the Bible says, seek first. In Matthew 6, the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added on to you. But it's got to be him first. That's what this is all about. Then these material things come. It's not the material things and then God. One more verse just to show you how the principle works. John 12, 24 says it like this. John 12, 24. Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. That doesn't make sense. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. He's talking about you and I. We got to get rid of ourself, die to ourself, so that we can do something that we can produce much gain in the things of God. It's a principle. So when he makes this statement, and the principle is in verse 39 of the 10th chapter of Matthew, once again, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What he's really saying is, you want to find real life. You do. He didn't say you couldn't have material things. He didn't say you couldn't have a wonderful home. Maybe two or three of them if you want. He doesn't care. He didn't say you couldn't have a wonderful car. He's not saying that. But what he's saying is he that says, I'm not important. And what is important if I'm dead, but God lives in me that produces great gain. And that's what this is all about. What's he talking about? He's talking about a deep commitment, deeper than we can even imagine oftentimes. We have this lukewarm commitment in most of Christian churches in America. Just go to church, it's okay, greasy grace will cover you. And it does to a certain degree. But then it becomes error, it becomes wrong. I love the words. And he, verse 38, who does not take up his cross, the cross is trouble, the cross is pain, the cross is shame, the cross is horrible. Pick up those horrible times and follow me. 
is not worthy of me. I don't know about you, but tonight, I want to be worthy. I've got one life to live. It's going to go by so fast, and so is yours. Don't you want to live it for him? It's so simple to do. Here's how. Get out of the way. That's uh, simple. Life is not just about me, even though I'm valuable. Life is about him. Because I take my value and I use it for his glory. And that's what life is all about. <laughs> Profound words of Jesus. If Jesus spoke to you, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? Real quick, I'm going to let you go in just a minute. Nobody get up and leave just yet because I want to finish this right tonight. Nobody get up and leave. That means nobody get up and leave. Everybody's getting up and leaving. Let's talk just for a moment. I'm going to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Is that all right? So important for us. We just heard a tremendous truth. If you deny me, I'll deny you. If you confess me, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. Man, those are amazing. Tonight I'm going to ask some of you to let go of your life and take on the life of Jesus Christ. Before we leave this place, you need to, some of you get right with God tonight. You need to be what Jesus calls born again. Giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life is what born again means. Let me say it again. Born again means giving God all of your heart. It means giving God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. My friends, it always has been. I didn't write those words. Jesus spoke what we read tonight. Jesus, wow. If you have a problem with it, you have to argue with him. And may I say this to you? He loves you and died for you so that you could have not only life here on earth, but he wants you to have eternal life that goes on forever and ever in being with him. And you're going to go somewhere when you die. Why not go to heaven and be with Jesus? And listen closely. You can't get to heaven because you know who Jesus is. The devil knows who Jesus is, and he's not going to heaven. I heard two young people talking, and one young person said to the other person, he said, do you know Jesus? And the other person said, yeah, I know Jesus. He said, okay, good, then you're a Christian. It's not true. Absolutely not true, but we think that all the time. Because you can't get to heaven just knowing who Jesus is, because it's not about what you have in your head, it's about what you've done with your heart. That's what this is all about. Some of you think you're going to get to heaven because your mom and dad told you you were a Christian when you were a kid. Had you christened or baptized as a baby. Took you to catechism class or Sunday school class. But can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll get you to heaven. That's not how you got to heaven. And because your mom and dad called you a Christian doesn't make you a Christian at all. In fact, you could even do it. Another thing is you can call yourself a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. It's not about positive thinking or positive confession. I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Makes me a Christian. It just doesn't work that way. The only way you become a Christian and go to heaven and denying, listen to me now, listen, listen, listen. Your presence in hell is to be born again. And Jesus makes it very clear. And what the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible tells us that born again means this that you have given God. You have to give it to him. He won't steal it from you. He's not a thief or a conniver or someone to talk you out of or a manipulator. Giving God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. So here we are in this safe, friendly place. We've sung songs. We've laughed. We've clapped hands. We've, you were great listening to the word of God tonight. Come on, be honest with yourself. You got something and God spoke to you tonight about life. And you know what? You're great, but don't leave this place that way. Don't leave this place. Get right with God by giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life. It's that simple. He said, if you confess me before men, remember that verse? I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand. By the raising of your hand, you're saying something to me. You're saying, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. In a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer. 
And you can be involved in that prayer. You can be a part of that prayer and we'll pray this prayer for you. And you're saying by the raising of your hand, include me in that prayer. I want to be included in that prayer to go to heaven. It's that simple. I'll see it. Remember what he said? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. I'll see it. You can put your hand right back down. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer you a gift, if I may, of privacy. Privacy means nobody's going to be looking, nobody's going to be watching you, nobody's going to see you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I will ask those of you that need to get right with God in a moment. I'll count three, pop my hands together, and you can put your hand up in this place and then put it right back down. What you're saying is include me in in that prayer. I want to be prayed for to go to heaven. All across this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Now, some of you got your eyes open and you're looking at me. Come on, close your eyes, bow your heads. I don't want to look at your cute little faces right now. I want to see your eyes closed. Let's give everybody privacy right now. If you've you've been running from God instead of to God, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know who you are. Get ready to put your hand up. Hold on, we'll do it all at the same time when I clap my hands. Hands are already going up. Hold on, hold on, we'll do it all at the same time. If you've never given them all of your life, you know who you are, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure, my goodness, make sure tonight is your night of salvation. I'm gonna count to three right now and you get your hand up. Everybody, heads bowed, eyes closed still. Come on, nobody looking around. I'm counting to three, pop my hands together. Let me see your hands and everybody keep your head and eyes closed. I wanna see your hands and then you can put them right back down. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, thank you, 13, thank you, 14, 15, thank you, 60, 17, 18, thank you. Over this side, anybody else that got your hand up? 18, thank you, 19, got you right over there, 19. If there's 19, there's gotta be 20 somewhere. Where's 20? 20, I already counted them over there. Over here, I didn't count anybody. There's another one there. Oh, I got you right there. I think I already counted him. I think I'm gonna go, go ahead and put your hand up. 20, 20, right there, 20. Thank you, God bless you, 21. Anybody else, anybody else real quick didn't get your hand up, but you know you should have? 22, thank you, got you. Anybody else, anybody else, anybody? Thank you, 23, got you. Right there, I see you. Got you, got your hand up, 23, thank you. I, another one back here, 24, thank you, God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, 25. Is that you standing there? Good. Good. Glory to God. Good for you. Man, making sure they're seeing. They're standing up. There's 26. I already got I already got them. I already got them. There's 25. Well, praise God for 25. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Come on. Isn't that great? Now, all 25 of you, I want you to raise your hands here. I want to give you some instructions. All 25, you don't get ra- you don't get saved by raising your hand. We're gonna pray, we're gonna pray together. I want you to get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get a friend. I want you to get out of your seat and meet me right here in front. I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. Come on, I'll let you go in a minute. But all 25 of you that raised your hand, you're serious about God, bring your friends, nudge them and say, come on, go with me, because I'm going. And listen, don't let anything stop you, man. Listen, if you, you know, if you're worried about what people think, who cares? Remember what he just talked about. This is not about what people think. This is about what God sees. Now I want all 25 of you that raise your hand, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. I want you to get out of your seat. If Jesus could be a beaten, bloody mess in the streets of Calcutta for you, guess what? Uh, uh, you can get out of the seat and walk down the safe aisle for him. So tonight is your night of salvation. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, get your stuff. Get down here right now. Come on.
Let's do this. Let's pray together. I'm going to go slow and say this out loud. If you miss a word, don't worry about it. Let it come from your heart to God. Is that okay? And you just repeat after me because this is going to be cool. And then you're going to be born again. So every head bowed, every eye closed, and everybody in this room, let's join in with our new brothers and sisters. Everybody say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son. I believe you sent him for me. I believe he died for me. I believe you raised him from the dead just for me. I believe his blood washes away my sins. I repent. I turn from evil and I turn to you, Jesus, with all of my heart and with all of my life. Let it be known from this day forward, you belong to me and I belong to you. I'm a Christian headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I've got the victory. I'm born again, alive forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Yay. Now, real quick. Okay, trust me. This is good. You guys, you know, just trust me. This is no weird stuff goes on. See this guy over here? His name is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. He's going to do two things. He's going to give you some free stuff. I wrote this little book called Welcome to Your Destiny. It's free. And it tells you what to do next now that you're a Christian. Okay, it's third grade reading level. Why? Because that's how I read, third grade, you know? So it's cool for you guys. All I have to do is do what it says, and that'll take you to this next step as far as growing in God. And then he'll introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Those are friends that'll help you get strong in Jesus instead of just letting you, you know, when you had a baby, you didn't just leave it at the hospital. You went and you took it home and you nourished it and took care of that baby and everything else. So let us take care of you during these first few weeks. It'll help you get strong in Jesus so you don't go back doing what you used to do. Real quick, people you came with, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Joel right over there. Right over there. Come on. Let's give the Lord a great big praise.